Um, my name is Kent McGuire. I run the Southern Education Foundation in Atlanta. Um, I was trying to think why I would be asked to chair this session. <laughs> but I have a curious history that may explain it. Um, but welcome. You all should move up so we can, if you're interested to do so. Um, uh, let me just provide a, just a bit of context and then talk about uh, who's with us to take up this issue of um, the Institute of Education Sciences. It's it's a brief history and it's promising future. I like to think of it that way. Mm -hmm. um, um, it was created, I think, or authorized in 2002. Is that right? I understand well its predecessor. Um, and so I appreciate um, some of the what motivated the creation of the uh, institute. It has four centers. I'm, I bet Peggy's going to describe all of that. Um, but three or four things come to mind about IES. Um, uh, I think it was a deliberate effort um, to clear out the non-research functions and activities uh, that had been part of a larger um, unit. I remember when I was in the government in my last year when you can do crazy things without consequence, um, I zeroed out all of the non-research activities in my budget, not because I didn't think they should happen, just but I didn't think my office should do them. And I was trying not to confuse people on the Hill or anywhere else about what the central purpose of the office really was. So I literally sent the money back to the sep deputy secretary and said, put this in some other place. He didn't do that, but, uh, but it sent the signal. I think that was one of the things that ultimately did happen with IES. Um, I think there was a, 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 an intent to sort of bring program evaluation into the orbit uh, of a larger sort of research organization rather than having it sit too close to the program work in the department, uh, which makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, same for special ed, which had uh, been nested in, um, in another office. Um, and possibly, although I think Tom and, uh, and Peggy will, will clarify this, uh, sort of created an opportunity to unify the design and execution of competitions uh, and even the management of, uh, of research activities if you had one group of talented people who could pay attention uh, under the right kind of leadership to how those things would cohere and add up. Um, and so, um, and finally, uh, I know that there had been in the country um, a longing for greater clarity about things that worked, an interest in more attention to what I'll call impact questions uh, in relationship to questions of process and context and correlations and the like. And so I think, you know, IES was set up in that spirit um, uh, with trying to do all of those things in mind. But let's find out. Uh, let's just find out. Um, uh, and we've got exactly the right group of people here to, uh, to, to do that. Um, Peggy Carr, who I used to work for. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and Tom Brock, who I used to work with. <laughs> <laughs> in different lives that I've led. Um, uh, this is the acting director uh, of, uh, of the Institute. Peggy uh, runs the Center on Statistics and uh, uh, cares for NAEP and many other, other things. And um, I'm guessing 
that because uh, Peggy's been there a while, she actually saw all of this happen. I did. And um, we should ask her to to say is what actually did happen and <laughs> and how's it been going. And um, and Tom came to it, uh, and um, and I think is in a great position to think out loud about the potential, you know, where things might head. If by chance Tom doesn't do that in a way that we fully appreciate, we have three more people to help with that. Let me tell you who they are. They're sitting in the office, in the audience, but we will get them up here. Um, Mike McPherson, whose timing is impeccable, uh, 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 has arrived. Um, and you got to think about him as a person who's had a keen eye uh, on developing talent uh, in the education research uh, uh, enterprise. Um, and, and I think of necessity from outside the government, really trying to uh, pay attention to this country's uh, education research infrastructure. Um, now, and then we've got two IES board members here, uh, Susanna Loeb, and Larry Hedges. Um, Google them. You could you you could find out all you'd want to know about uh, about any of them, um, and we'll see uh, what they have to add to this discussion. Um, I would, uh, in particular, press Larry <laughs> to comment on the evaluation activities uh, at IES, because I know he's been involved in issues of trying to improve their design. Um, uh, I would press Susanna Loeb. Um, well, she's spent lots of IES money, so you can ask her what she thinks the returns uh, uh, to her work have, have been, but, but she cares a lot about um, the effective and thoughtful use of longitudinal data sets, and I would press her uh, uh, in that regard. If uh, I've warned them, so they may just bring those things up in advance. But um, uh, but that's the session we're about to have. Uh, we have 90 minutes. I have used almost 10 of them. I apologize for that. Um, and so we'll want to try to move through this in such a way that. Uh, we get some time to hear from all of you as well. And with that, uh, probably we'll Tom first. Tom. Okay, yes. very good. All right, thank you so much, Kent. And uh, thanks to all of you for coming up, uh, showing up this morning, I should say. Uh, I think it's always a test of dedication or stamina, I'm not sure which, uh, to see who shows up for an early Sunday morning session, uh, particularly in a multi-day meeting like, like AERA. The AER con AERA conference theme is Knowledge to Action, Achieving the Promise of Educational Opportunity. And I think the Institute of Education Sciences plays a critical role in delivering on this promise. It gathers data, it conducts rigorous evaluations of education programs, it sponsors research on the nation's most pressing education needs and problems, all for the purpose of expanding educational opportunity and ensuring the best education outcomes for students of all ages. Our session today was organized to reflect on IES's accomplishments and also its path going forward. And I think it's an appropriate time to have this discussion. IES has been in existence for 15 years, as you heard Ken say, so we have enough of a track record to kind of pause and take stock of IES's accomplishments. The November election, I think, also requires all of us to take a fresh look at the role of the federal government, what it does, what it doesn't do, uh, particularly in the area of research, evaluation, and statistics, our topic today. So let me just start with a very brief history. Like cell phones and Star Starbucks, it kind of seems like IES has always been with us. But uh, in fact, that is not the case. It is true, as Kent alluded to, that IES did have its predecessors. Uh, in particular, the Office of Education Research and Improvement, which Kent headed for a while, uh, was in operation between 1979 and 2002. 
And before that, there was the National Institute of Education, which existed from 1971 to 1979. These offices did, in fact, carry out some of the same kinds of functions that IES does today. But uh, I think many would say, and, and I think Kent would probably agree, uh, there were perhaps some underlying structural flaws that uh, undermined their effectiveness or limited their effectiveness. OERI, as you heard Kent mention, uh, was responsible for administering program grants as well as research grants. And the two sometimes were a bit in conflict uh, with each other. In fact, if you look at the spending patterns of OERI, far more resources went out the door in those early years for program purposes than for research purposes. So some say there was not really the strategic focus that was needed in a research agency. It was also generally acknowledged that OERI and its predecessor, uh, the National Institute of Education, did not have a large cadre of scientifically uh, prepared or trained staff, um, and that the agencies as a whole were not keeping up with some of the methodological advances that were occurring in other fields, such as public health and welfare and employment and training. In particular, uh, the growing interest in using randomized control trials and other methods to really understand the causal effects of policies and program interventions. And these offices also reported to the cabinet secretaries responsible for education, and thus were subject to potential political bias or influence. A negative evaluation report, for instance, could be suppressed uh, if the secretary felt it did not reflect well on his or her personal priorities uh, or the administration's priorities. So IES, or more properly, the Institute of Education Sciences, really changed all of that. It provided a singular mission which was to provide scientific information on which to ground education practice and policy and share this information in formats that are useful and accessible to educators, parents, policymakers, researchers, and the public. That's a direct quote from the law. The Education Sciences Reform Act also consolidated the research evaluation and statistics functions under one roof and called for scientifically trained leadership and staff. And the law really affirmed the nonpartisan nature of education research and gave IES an independent role to publish reports without any approval from the cabinet secretary. Of course, an agency doesn't just form, you know, because of what's written on, on paper in a law. Uh, and I just want to briefly acknowledge uh, the prior leadership of IES. Uh, we really are fortunate to have had several strong leaders who have built the organization and shaped its culture. Russ Whitehurst, uh, as many of you know, was the first director of IES. He was appointed by President Bush. Uh, he is, I think, more responsible than anyone for putting the various programs and procedures of IES into place, including its rigorous peer review process uh, for determining who receives research grants. He recruited well-trained statisticians and evaluators, and I think, as everyone knows, was a very strong advocate for causal inference studies, something for which IES is still very much known. John Easton, uh, the second director, was appointed by President Obama. And John brought also a, a passion and a commitment to rigorous research, but tried to put equal weight, weight on the relevance uh, of the research, particularly for education practitioners. John was a champion of the idea of researcher-practitioner partnerships, started a grant program by that name at IES, and indeed that philosophy of bringing researchers and practitioners together to identify key problems, to work together on data collection and analysis and interpretation is an idea that in fact is infusing much of what we do. And Ruth Neal, my immediate predecessor, uh, was acting director of IES for 18 months. Uh, she really made progress in better integrating IES within the decision-making structure of the education department. Uh, this sometimes was uh, the downside of being independent. Sometimes we were almost too removed from the key policy discussions that were taking place. She helped make sure IES was at the table uh, for major policy discussions within the department. She also really brought IES into the modern age, particularly with uh, communications and social media, uh, to make sure that our, word and our words and our products were getting out. Lastly, I just want to really underscore the important role that the National Board of Education Sciences has played throughout IES's history. Uh, they are responsible for approving IES's priorities, uh, providing feedback to IES on ways that we can continually improve as a research agency. So just a few facts and figures about IES. The Institute currently employs about 180 people. It has an annual budget of $618 million. 
um, which sounds like a lot of money probably to you and me, I will note. Uh, while it is a lot of money in, in some metrics, uh, it also represents less than 1% of the Department of Education's total budget, just to kind of put things in perspective. As Kent alluded to, uh, it's organized into four centers. And I would say, although we are a small organization with a relatively small budget, at least from a departmental perspective, I think we pack a very big punch. So I'd like to shift now and talk about five critical areas where I think IES makes a uh, important and ongoing difference. First of all, um, IES is responsible for leading both the national and international uh, data collection that's used to assess the academic skills and progress of American students. IES, and more specifically NCES, is really the source that politicians, school officials, parents, teachers, the media go to when they want to understand how U.S. schools and how U.S. students are performing, and they want to understand trends over time. Peggy is going to say a lot more about some of this in a minute, so I don't want to steal her thunder. But let me just uh, very briefly highlight the National Assessment of Education Progress, known as the Nation's Report Card, uh, which is used to uh, to measure proficiency in core subjects like math and reading uh, and science. Uh, you may have also seen the uh, press release uh, and the report that came out last week on student abilities in the arts. So mm -hmm. NAEP is really known for assessing student abilities across a number of different subject areas. NCES and IES are also responsible for international assessments, such as the Program for International Student Assessment, or PISA, which allows us to compare the math, science, and literacy skills of 15-year-olds in the U.S. to 15-year-olds all over the world. Uh, and that, too, is really critically important from a policy perspective to get a better indicator for how the U.S. is doing relative to other countries that we view as our competitors. So a second major contribution that IES makes is to conduct the annual grants competitions uh, to support innovative research in education and in special education. The bar charts that you see on the slides here show the number of grants that each center, the National Center for Education Research and the National Center for Special Education Research, have made since they each got started and were funded. I think most of you know these are highly competitive grants. Uh, they are really designed to reward uh, grants to projects that have the strongest research designs, uh, the most capable people leading the projects, and are the, focused on the most significant or critical issues, such as how do we really ensure that every child learns how to read at grade level? How do we meet the education needs of children with autism spectrum disorder or other kinds of disabilities? How do we improve the education, uh, how do we advance rather the academic preparation for college, uh, for students to be ready for college and to succeed in college once they get there, particularly students from low income families or families without a history of college going? These are just some of the kinds of questions that NCER and NICSER funded researchers address every year. The research programs uh, also are very much at the forefront of kind of new fields, cutting edge issues, uh, such as developing and piloting new education technologies to improve teaching and learning in the classroom, uh, using games, for instance, on tablets so that kids don't even know that they're learning while they're engaged in some of these activities. IES has also been at the forefront of the whole field of social and emotional learning, uh, which is talked about widely and generally agreed as important today. But that was not true uh, just a few years ago, for instance. As you can see from the bar charts, uh, if you did some quick math in your head, um, the core education research and special education research programs of the two centers uh, have so far uh, made over a thousand research grants. Um, I just want to note for you that uh, in both centers, uh, the type of grant that is most common uh, is the development and innovation grant, uh, where a lot of the money is actually reserved for developing new curricula or teaching tools, things of that sort. Uh, we really are an incubation lab for new ideas, and that often is not well understood about IES. The second most common uh, area of funding for both centers is the efficacy uh, or effectiveness trial. Uh, I think this is more what IES is known for, but contrary to popular belief, it's not actually the major thing that we fund, either in terms of number of grants or actual dollars going out the door. A third thing uh, that IES does that I think is critically important is to set methodological standards for the field and to provide support for methodological training and advancement. 
Uh, what you see here uh, depicted are two very recent publications uh, going from left to right uh, that are designed as teaching tools for the classroom as well as resources or guides for current uh, education researchers to use. Um, the first one uh, on the left uh, is uh, a new report that was produced on descriptive analysis, and Susanna Loeb was the lead author of that, as you see. Uh, this truly has been an IES bestseller, and again, I think it's caught the field a little bit by surprise because uh, it is about descriptive analysis. It's about mining large data sets to make meaning of those data sets. It's about uh, procedures one can use to understand underlying causal mechanisms behind programs. Uh, it is about, in part, uh, better uses of data visualization to present information of a descriptive nature. Uh, and again, it's just an example, of, I think, of the wide breadth uh, of IES's methodological work. The second uh, study that you see indicated here is on single case designs, which again has been really pathbreaking, I think, particularly in the field of special education, uh, because this is about how to have strong causal inference studies, uh, particularly in cases like special education, where you have uh, children with severe needs, but not a large number of children within a particular sample. So you can't kind of go by the usual randomized control trial that requires very large numbers uh, in order to get a strong impact estimate. All the way on the right, then, you see uh, some of the publications of the What Works Clearinghouse. The What Works Clearinghouse, or the WWC, uh, really serves as kind of the consumer reports uh, of the education research community. Uh, what it does uh, through its ongoing reviews is to help policymakers and practitioners and other researchers know how much credence, honestly, to put into a particular evaluation study. Uh, it assesses the design as well as the execution uh, to know whether or not uh, the particular findings from that report are valid. To date, the WWC has reviewed over 9,000 individual studies, which I think is astonishing. Uh, over 600 of those individual studies meet the various, very highest uh, design criteria, that is, meets WWC standards without reservations. Increasingly, the What Works Clearinghouse has taken to summarizing these results, which is what you see pictured here uh, with one of the practice guides that looks across studies for common features or principles that educators uh, can use in the classroom. These, in fact, are the most popular products of everything that IES produces, generating thousands of downloads each month. A fourth important area where IES uh, makes, I think, a significant and ongoing uh, contribution is in training of new researchers, uh, both new researchers entering the profession as well as uh, people perhaps uh, in an early career or even a mid-career mid phase uh, of their, their work. This uh, handsome group you see depicted right here uh, is actually uh, a group that attended the Cluster Randomized Control uh, Trial Summer Workshop that's led by Larry Hedges and colleagues at Northwestern University each summer. It's an intensive two-week workshop in which people learn how to conduct randomized control trials in which schools or classrooms are the unit of analysis rather than individual students. Very popular and very important. The summer workshops like this and others we offer completely free of charge. Um, there are many others in quasi-experimental methods, uh, cost analysis, uh, NCES, uh, our statistics agency, has a very important summer conference called Stats DC, uh, for which registration has just opened recently, uh, in which you can go and learn about various NCES data sets that are available for use and how to use those data sets to answer your particular questions. In addition to the summer workshops uh, that I've just named, uh, IES supports pre-doctoral training. Uh, we currently have 10 programs around the country uh, operated by some of the leading research universities around the U.S. Uh, we have trained to date nearly 900 fellows uh, to earn PhDs focused on the education sciences. We also support postdoctoral programs uh, and to date have funded about 180 postdoc fellowships. And lastly, I will just mention briefly our new Pathways to Education Sciences program, which we're very excited about because this is starting earlier in the pipeline. It is to identify uh, promising juniors and seniors in college, uh, as well as recent college graduates who may be interested in entering the uh, education sciences profession, but perhaps hadn't thought about it as, as a career or had as much support uh, in, in preparing for a PhD program as some other students. Um, we are particularly uh, uh, focused on minority serving institutions as either the host institution or, or, or a critical partner institution in running these pathways programs. And those are just now getting started in several places around the country. 
So the fifth uh, major area of contribution I wanted to mention is IES's role in building the capacity of state and local education agencies to design and conduct research on education issues that are important to them. I mentioned a moment ago the researcher practitioner partnerships that John Easton started. Uh, I also would be remiss if I didn't mention the work of the regional education labs, which you see depicted on the map with the different color-coded areas. Uh, each of these regions has its own lab, which is responsible for interacting with local state, uh, local and state policymakers to design studies uh, and to explain and interpret high-quality studies that they can use for decision-making. In addition to the RELs, as part of this uh, effort to build state and local capacity, IES has made uh, important grants for state uh, longitudinal data systems. Um, and the map here in dark blue represents all of the states that have received one of those grants. 47 states uh, plus a few territories and the District of Columbia now have received uh, not only funding, but technical assistance from IES on how to build such systems for use uh, in education research. So I could go on and on, um, but let me just stop at this point in my talk and say I think it's safe to say without IES, this conference would be greatly diminished. We'd probably have fewer people, certainly fewer studies, less agreement, I think, on what some of the major education problems and challenges are that we all need to tackle. By extension, our knowledge about and capacity to improve education in the U.S. would be greatly diminished. So, as you know, IES and the federal government uh, is in a period of transition. Uh, IES lacks a permanent director. I stand before you for that reason. Uh, IES's budget is still a question mark. Uh, as you've all been following the news, uh, let me tell you, we at IES were sweating bullets this week. If the continuing resolution had not been uh, passed, we might not be able to get home uh, after this conference. So we're, <laughs> we're very glad there's at least a one-week extension. But we're still waiting on the FY17 appropriation and waiting for details on the FY18 uh, budget. And lastly, the Education Sciences Reform Act, the critical underpinning of IES, uh, has actually expired and needs to be reauthorized. So I hear a lot of worry and consternation about these issues, which I certainly understand. But what I want to reinforce this morning with all of you is that IES does have a very strong infrastructure. The organization that I described at the beginning of my talk is intact. It is moving forward. And the legal framework uh, of the Education Sciences Reform Act still provides uh, our roadmap. Uh, we are still using that uh, uh, and are authorized to use that until the law uh, is once again considered by Congress. And I would particularly underscore the words of that law, uh, stressing that IES and its work will always conform to the highest standards of quality, integrity, and accuracy, and that the work of IES will be objective, secular, neutral, non-ideological, and free of partisan influence and racial, cultural, or regional bias. That's a direct quote from the law. And I have to tell you, in, in just the few months that I've been in this role of uh, acting director, I've been encouraged uh, by how much support that mission continues to generate from people across the political spectrum. Of course, uh, IES, like any organization, still has to evolve and respond to new opportunities and priorities. Uh, I highlighted on the slide just a couple of them. Uh, one is technological advancement, uh, clearly having a profound effect uh, on education research and education researchers. Um, and, you know, this is kind of a good news, bad news scenario in some ways. We certainly can't stop it, so it is what it is. But uh, on the one hand, it does make it possible to greatly accelerate the pace of data collection and analysis. Uh, certainly the potential of big data uh, to answer all kinds of new education questions, to literally capture the keystrokes of students while they're sitting at their laptops or computers, really does open up new possibilities for education researchers. But I think the flip side of that is how do we avoid getting drowned in data? How do we continue to make sure that the research we are doing is meaningful and relevant, to go back to, to John Easton's uh, main points? And there are all sorts of privacy concerns that we have to be very worried about, uh, protecting personal identifiable data uh, to make sure it does not fall into the wrong hands as we begin to move out and into lots of different data sets and bring these together. On the policy side, uh, there are also important new questions that will continue to need to be addressed. Um, the new administration, uh, I think you're all aware, is very focused on school choice as a primary area of interest. And in fact, this is an area where IES has supported a lot of research already, so it's not new to us. Mm -hmm. But we're in a continual position of trying to 
you know, decide among our limited priorities, where do we need to put more emphasis uh, versus uh, perhaps less emphasis? Some of those core issues like improving reading, improving math skills will always be with us. But as we think about school choice, for instance, how do we move beyond some of the, uh, I guess, summative evaluation work, the up and down studies that have been done on these programs to dig deeper into various implementation choices and how if a state or a school district is going to have a choice program, do we really optimize the chances for low income and other disadvantaged students to succeed academically in those environments? Another area where I think IES needs to involve is to, to evolve is to place greater emphasis on funding replication work of intervention studies that provide evidence of positive effects. As I noted at the start of my talk, the What Works Clearinghouse now contains a growing body of intervention studies that show positive effects. But the problem is most of those studies are still one-offs. They reflect the findings of a single school or a single school district, one small region. And we know, in fact, that it's often difficult to replicate results from any study, even in a similar environment, let alone as you move perhaps to different kinds of contexts. So I think we need to place much more emphasis on the replication work, and along with it, much more emphasis on synthesis and meta-analysis to help policymakers and practitioners make sense of those findings. Finally, IES needs to place increased emphasis on building the capacity of state and, local state and local education agencies to use and conduct their own research. The new education law that Congress passed a year ago, December, the Every Student Succeeds Act, really demands this uh, of us. Uh, it, it envisions a world uh, in which much of the federal role is decentralized to states and school districts. Now, IES had already been moving a little bit in this direction uh, with the aforementioned uh, researcher practitioner partnerships, the research alliances and the RELs, uh, all of that. But I think we have to continue to move in that direction. We also have to do a much better job of communicating research. Uh, I think it is still the case, and this is something that I think we all take responsibility for. We are much more comfortable talking to other researchers about what we're learning uh, than we are to the policymaker and practitioner communities. Just looking at this amazing conference uh, and all of the sessions uh, and all of the topics covered, uh, it is just striking to me how few practitioner voices really are at the table. And maybe there's a good rationale for that, but I think it is something we have to continue to question ourselves on. And as John Easton often said, wouldn't it be the case that perhaps many of our research questions could actually be sharper uh, if we had more practitioner voices at the table to think through both the front end design as well as the ap actual application of study results. So to conclude, I just want to say, first off, I think we have a lot to celebrate about IES at 15 years. I also want to say, I think we still have a lot to do. <laughs> and so on this, I really invite your help. Please, please tell us how we can improve uh, at IES. Our phone lines are open, our email is open, God knows. Um, uh, we want to hear from you uh, about your particular ideas. That really helps us kind of figure out where we need to move next. Please share your thoughts on funding priorities, <coughs> recognizing that we are not likely to be in a situation anytime soon of increased funding. So think about that $618 yeah. million dollar, you mm -hmm. know, amount that I, I said earlier. That, that is what we have to work with for everything that we do, everything I've described <coughs> plus a number of, of activities I've not described. I think IES as an agency is stable, but it <coughs> cannot be taken for granted. It's a very valuable resource. It's a very precious resource, but there's no guarantee in the Constitution that we're going to have an education research agency of this type. It is a discretionary act on the part of Congress and the White House every year to keep this work going. So I really ask for your help then also in just communicating why this work matters, why we need a federal research evaluation and statistics agency. If you yourself are the recipient of federal funding, whether it's from IES or the National Science Foundation or any other source, Please make that part of your message when you go out to talk about the work. Make sure that policymakers and the media understand where this came from, because it's just too easy to leave that out, and it's too easy for people to think that the federal government is not investing in work that matters. You are the ones that have to tell that story. Working together, I think there's a lot more we can do to ensure that there'll be many more accomplishments for IES and many more anniversaries to come. So thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Tom. <clears throat> While you're standing there, while you're standing there, um, 
any changes at all that you think should be made in your underlying you know legislative authority you know given the experience of 15 years or uh, are you pretty well set up to do uh, you know what you need to do money notwithstanding what would you yes. say about that yes <laughs> money notwithstanding okay um, <laughs> I think in general uh, we at IES uh, think the original Education Sciences Reform Act was a pretty well thought out law um, I know there are some differences of opinion about some of the details. Um, one thing I will say uh, on the research side, and I'm normally the research commissioner when I'm not in this uh, acting director role, there is a lot of specificity about particular topic areas, about how many research and development centers we need to have versus you know, other kinds of things we might do. And one thing, one change we were hoping for in the new law was just a little more flexibility to consider new approaches to working. <laughs> For instance, recently we started a research network uh, idea as an alternative to the R&D center, uh, really to try to mm -hmm. build broader communities working on important topics rather than concentrate all of our resources in one set of researchers or one, one place. So that's a change we would like to see. But I think that's a good question for some of our okay, discussants we'll, we'll and come back to, to it. also yeah, great. address. Great. Thanks. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ms. Peggy? I want to first thank Tom for a wonderful talk. Even I was moved by that, and I've been here <laughs> well over a couple of decades now, and I, I can say there's, there's a lot um, going on, and you articulated it very well. I was even moved by those pictures of the former directors, and it was sort of nostalgic mm -hmm. because I've been here through all of them, and to be here with Kent, who I have to say, this is a perfect opportunity to say thank you for your service. Mm. And you did, uh, you were very impactful um, during the time uh, you were there. So my talk is a little different. Um, I'm here representing the National Center for Education Statistics. And so we're about numbers and details. And so a little less general and more about some of the activities that we're doing. I want to start uh, first by sort of laying out exactly uh, what I hope to accomplish in, in my talk, a little bit about who we are, how we got here, some highlights of our recent and upcoming findings. We're going to be publishing lots of publications and our condition of education. I want to give you some highlights of those, uh, those data. Then what's new at NCES, what you should be on the outlook for. And yes, we've been doing some strategic thinking as well. I'll share that with you. So our origins are far reaching. Um, the first office asked to do what NCS now does started back in 1867. So we have some historical roots and we've been doing this. We would like to say very well for many, many decades. We're now one of 13 primary statistical uh, agencies uh, in the federal government. We are the third largest behind uh, census and the Bureau of Labor Statistics. But in terms of funding, well, we are about eight, about 360 million a year. We only have like 112, maybe less uh, FTE. And so we do a lot uh, with a few uh, employees. Our, our goal, our mandate is to collect, collate, and analyze and disseminate data on the condition of education in this country and also put it in context of the international uh, education community. Tom laid that out very nicely. So this is sort of the big picture of our portfolio. portfolio. You can think about it in a couple ways. We uh, categorize our data collections into sample surveys and uh, longitudinal studies, assessments of both national and international, and administrative data collections. You can also think about the types of data we collect at various stages from birth, early childhood, to adulthood, late adulthood. The early childhood includes the popular ECLSK, early childhood longitudinal, <clears throat> excuse me, birth 
and kindergarten uh, series. And then, of course, there's NAEP. You've heard about NAEP already uh, this morning. And the international uh, assessments are also collected. The national part of the international assessments are our responsibility, TIMS, PISA, PEARLS, PIAC. You've heard of them as well. The most popular one under the post-secondary would be IPES, the Integrated Post-Secondary uh, uh, Education Data System. And of course, uh, as I indicated, we have adult uh, data collection, and PIAC is a, basically a functional literacy uh, assessment. Well, um, the ones in red, I want to tell you a little bit more about, and I want to use as a context uh, the condition of education. We uh, release annual reports to Congress every year. This condition of education uh, is uh, uh, released uh, to Congress on June 1st of every year, and we never miss a date. I should also point out that the Digest of Education just celebrated its 50th edition. Again, an indication that we've been around mm -hmm. for a while. So a little bit about what you're going to see in those publications, the condition of education in particular, and the uh, digest. The condition of education has, excuse me, 42 uh, indicators. And what I want to show you next are some of the highlights of things that you're going to see in those indicators. The K-12 expenditures for uh, uh, the schools in this country per pupil uh, has gone up. Um, between 03 and 14, until we got to around 09 and 12, where we saw a decline. But what you'll see in our release uh, data and the condition of ed is that it's now on its way back up. Here you, uh, you see who is attending our high poverty schools in this country. Uh, as you might suspect, nearly half of Hispanic and black students in public schools or in these high poverty schools, as defined by 75% of the students eligible for free and reduced price lunch, and low poverty is defined by 25% or less eligible for free and reduced price lunch. So again, one half for um, Hispanic and black students, one third for Native American students, 15% of Asian students in this country attend high poverty schools, and 8% of white students attend these schools. Well, our high school graduation rates, though, are on the rise. Uh, in our latest release for 2015, the high school graduation rate was 82, uh, 83.2. I'll give you uh, a little insight, some secrets. We used to give Arnie Duncan a, a uh, shirt that had the, uh, the number on it but no one knew what was on the shirt, and, but him, he knew that. He was always very proud of that because it went up the entire time he was there. What you'll see here also are the racial ethnic uh, trends, and you can see it's ticking up for all of the groups. Post-secondary enrollment has been going up but what we're going to report in our condition of education is now on the decline. Post-secondary financial aid. What you see here uh, primarily, there's a lot of data, but the only thing I would suggest that you focus on is mm -hmm. who's getting uh, loans and who's getting grants. And students who are attending private uh, for-profit uh, institutions are more likely to receive uh, loans and then students who are in the private institutions, and that is the same thing uh, happening for grants. You see uh, 72 in comparison to 32 for students attending the private institutions. We had a big year in 2015. A lot uh, of our data surrounded uh, for our international and national assessment surrounded um, reading, and mathematics, and science uh, uh, indicators of what students know and can do at various grades, grades four, eight, uh, and year 15 years old with PISA, and grade 12. So we, we struggled, quite honestly, to figure out what all of this was saying. It was sort of a perfect storm. 
But I can tell you a few highlights that uh, you, can, you can walk away with today is that uh, relatively more progress has been made at the earlier grades. Perhaps that's not surprising for you. And look at those red arrows. We're struggling in mathematics. And we see that across multiple uh, data collections. Um, Tim shows something a little different, but behind the scenes, like, we kind of know what's going on there. The other point I wanted to make is that if you compare these data uh, with our international uh, rankings, we do better in reading, followed by science, and I guess you're not surprised that we do worse globally in mathematics. Well, in addition to the condition of education, we are also asked to produce other uh, mandated reports by Congress. I thought I'd share just a few of them with you today. Uh, we just released the guidelines for minimum sample size for ESSA. That is a requirement in ESSA. And what this report does is to give guidelines to states and jurisdictions on how to determine the sample size so that it's a valid and reliable and statistically uh, uh, defensible sample size. We were also asked to collect data and release data about uh, certification and experience of teachers in the U.S. Well, who are, who are they teaching? Who are they not teaching? Who gets to be taught by a certified teacher and an experienced teacher? So that is released. I invite you to, to Google that. In addition, you might not know, but we produce the formulas. There are four major formulas for uh, Title I. And this is, these formulas are used to distribute Title I funds across the country. Well, Congress was a little concerned about urban schools, the urban areas, and they wanted us to go back and take a look at those formula and see if we can improve upon them. So uh, very soon you'll see a report out on, on that work. And we are working with stakeholders. We're not doing this in a vacuum. And finally, Congress asked us to produce a report on internet access for students. They're concerned about uh, teachers uh, not giving out homework that requires uh, internet access at home or the assignments that they, they're actually doing in school or they're being hampered by the lack of uh, access in school and again uh, uh, at home or in the community. Both of these latter two reports will be uh, released within the next six months or so. Now I want to turn to what is new at NCES. And again, this may seem like a hodgepodge, but these are the things that we've done, um, some enhancements to the data collection, so we just have new data collections, and we're really uh, happy to share with you what we've done uh, today. I want to start out with uh, NTPS. I hope I don't slip into too many acronyms, but the National Teachers and Principal Survey is the new SAS, and you may have heard of that, the School and Staffing Survey. That's been around since 1987. It collects data on teachers and principals and the schools and the environment, their preparation, providing the context of learning for, for students. Uh, I also, also thought it might be interesting to share with you that we're going to do a pilot with NAEP in which we're going to link the two and we're going to be able to determine the, the relationship between the information we gather about teachers and principals and the schools with the students' performance, at least in the fourth, eighth, and twelfth grade. Here's another one, our middle school longitudinal study. We uh, have, 2018 is when this is going to be uh, uh, collected. We're going to start this longitudinal study then. It will collect data for grades uh, six through eight. We really have a nice portfolio of longitudinal studies, starting with the ECLSK series. We have a high school longitudinal data collection, and we have a couple of post-secondary longitudinal data collection. But there was this big hole in our series with the middle school, and that's what this feels. Uh, it will uh, assess growth in mathematics and literacy, and it will use uh, digitally based uh, uh, techniques in collecting these data. It will also collect data on social emotional development and uh, executive functions. And this is something that we collect in many of our longitudinal 
uh, data collections. We will oversample for students in a couple of IDEA categories, most notably for you, uh, autism. And there are a couple of others, but the autism one may have some particular meaning since the prevalence is growing, or at least the recognition of it is. NIPSAS, uh, the acronym for the National Post-Secondary Student Aid uh, Study, is a data collection about how uh, students pay for post-secondary uh, education. Uh, we're going to be releasing the most recent data collection for this one uh, in the next couple of months. And um, what I wanted to point out is that the sample for NIPSAS is used as the basis for our post-secondary longitudinal survey. And we're just getting uh, ready to, well, we've already started actually on the uh, baccalaureate and beyond is that's the next one out of this uh, cohort. Uh, I, I heard just the other day, uh, Kent, you mentioned something about CR, uh, CRDC. Uh, I thought this audience would, would like to know that NCES is working with the Office of Civil Rights to improve the quality of that data collection. We're working in partnership uh, with them. We're actually responsible now for the data collection. Uh, this is the third time since we've uh, been involved that uh, we have tools that people can uh, access and have better uh, uh, access to the various types of variables and, and uh, analysis that they want to do with this data set. And you're going to be able to download, starting with the 1314, the, the actual public uh, release data set from, from the uh, website. All School districts, 17,000 plus, are required to uh, participate in this data collection. And the universe data collection, uh, this is the third time that, and that we've done it. OK. Technical difficulty here. All right. At the uh, base of our data collections, we have a C, the CCD. It is the basis for our uh, sampling frame. So this is very, very important. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, several of the studies that I, I uh, saw today and in, in the uh, list of the program use the CCD. So I know that it's important to our stakeholders. Uh, it is also the collection that is used to give the profile of financial and non-financial data for all public schools and school districts and for the states. And we're going to be uh, releasing these various files separately and not waiting until they're all done. So for those of you who use CCD, this is a big thing. IPES, as I mentioned earlier, is our post-secondary uh, data collection. There are 12 surveys here. And the big thing here is that we're putting on our website the ability to download the data files. This is also a big thing. Maybe you don't get excited about these sort of things, but this is sort of a big deal for us, and we really <laughs> wanted to tell you about that. <laughs> now, um, I want to say a little bit about um, what we're going to be doing with our digitally-based assessments. The digitally-based assessments, uh, as Tom pointed out, is where we're moving with all of our national and international assessments. These digitally-based assessments allow us to improve measurement and accuracy. They allow us to measure constructs better than we've measured before or to measure new constructs that we have not been able to measure. It's a better alignment of how students are taught and how students learn. It's more cost efficient. Scoring is more efficient administration and the design of our assessments will be more efficient with this approach. And the data collection allows for more engaging, authentic, and accessible uh, access to uh, our data. We use universal design as well as accommodations. And I'd like to point out we're going to be adding a couple of uh, um, uh, studies to this cadre uh, on the international side, the International Computer and Information Literacy Study and the International Early Learning Study. I'll tell you more about those during question and answer if you want to know more. 
But all of these studies will be collecting digital footprints of how students will interact with these assessments. And this is an example of what a digital footprint might look like. What you have here are eight students. That's on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, you have the time they spent with the passage and the questions they were asked to respond to for the passage. The color is also important because the color tells you how the student moved through the passage and then read the questions about the passage. Did, did they do this in a methodical, sequential way? And you can determine that by the color. Blue means that they were engaging with the passage. The green and the brown means that they were then starting to answer the questions. So what can we learn from this? At the bottom, you see that first, the first student, well, it doesn't look like that student even read the passage, <laughs> let alone answered most of the questions. So it's the second student. But the ones at the top did what we think is a pretty good job. They read the passage page after page and then started doing the work of answering the questions. Well, maybe this isn't so exciting to you, but maybe this is. Mm. What this shows you are students who move through a passage, in this case also a poem, that's the sort of pink part. And the students on the left are the students in the top 25th percentile, and the students at the bottom are the students in the bottom distribution of the ability. And the first thing you note is that the students on the left are doing the job. They're reading the passage and the poem, and then they're going about the work of answering the questions. But the students on the right, not so much. This is where we're going with these digitally based assessments. And not just in NAEP, these are examples are from NAEP, but from, for all of those international studies that Tom and I have been talking with you about today. So lastly, I want to talk a, a little bit about moving forward. Back in 1986, the National Academy of, uh, of, of Science did an evaluation of NCES. And uh, it was called Creating a Center for Education Statistics, a Time for Action. Very suitable title since what they said to us is, if you don't get your act together, you should close your doors. And there were some very strong recommendations. And so when I started uh, acting in this position, one of the first things I wanted to know was, how are we doing today? So we gather a, a NIS a panel um, from the National Institute for Statistical Services, and they pulled together a very uh, talented, independent uh, panel of academics government and public sector uh, experts in the field of statistics and evaluation, and they gave us a big thumbs up. They said that we're doing fine with the recommendations uh, identified out of the uh, 1986 and gave us some suggestions about how to move forward. The three recommendations I wanted to share with you today is they thought that we should be very clear about our vision and be very agile about making decisions about what data we should continue to collect, when and why, and when should we start and stop data collections. Good advice. In addition, they thought that we should think about our stakeholders in a broader sense. You know, it's not just the researchers. We like researchers, but it's not just the researchers anymore. We should think about uh, different types of audiences, and they are our stakeholders too. So for example, we added to our portfolio of 40 some odd uh, stakeholder panels that we work with, a teacher's panel. We had been talking to everyone, but the teachers imagined that. Mm -hmm. So um, <laughs> that's uh, a, an example. And they thought that we should be more innovative and I've shown you a, a bit of that. But I can't uh, help but say that we're doing some other things uh, not shown here to move us forward such as innovative tasks, we're looking at virtual worlds, we're looking at uh, scenario-based tasks and things of that sort to move us forward. Um, I wanna thank you uh, for your attention and for uh, indulging with me on the details part of IES, but I'll entertain any general questions if, if you have an interest. Thank you. Peggy, thank you too very much.
Um, yeah, let's see, what should we do now? Um, I actually think if Mike and uh, Susanna and Larry, you come up here, I'll move over here. That'll get the, to get the three of you up here. Uh, that would be good. And while that's happening, um, if there's a, an immediate question or comment to what you heard. Uh, Well, you know, the uh, Census Bureau who heads up uh, that initiative, they, in fact, they're one of the 13 federal statistical agencies that I meet with uh, once a month. They're constantly uh, trying to get the rest of us to, to join in. But there, there are a lot of uh, um, peculiar requirements that they have um, that we, we need to work through. So only a few of the agencies have, have joined. It's, it's, that's not a no. Uh, but we've got to work out the uh, nuances. You know, our sense, uh, most of the federal statistical research data centers are more about economic data, but because our center is more about right. social science and education data, it'd be a big help to the type of researchers that we would service. Well, the, what I can say to you is that the Ryan Commission is trying to help us work through the, uh, the federal laws that uh, there are barriers and us trying to merge these data sets. We don't collect <coughs> laws under the same privacy and confidentiality requirements, and that's part of the issue. But we're looking into it. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see if in about the next 15 minutes, that puts some pressure on our discussants, um, if we can get any comments or perspectives on what well, I thought we got a very good overview both of the Institute broadly speaking uh, and some of the things that it's um, thinking about doing and planning to do um, I was really intrigued with um, Peggy's uh, review uh, you know this quick snapshot of what some of the surveys are telling us is sort of going on and and then all the underlying work uh, to strengthen and improve the kind of surveys that uh, on which those reports are based so I'm just curious you know Larry uh, Susanna uh, Michael um, I don't care who goes let's let Susanna don't you think? Because I'm like you said, I didn't know I was on this panel right, until this morning. That's <laughs> <laughs> fresh ideas. That's, that's that's fresh, ideas. fresh ideas. That's that's right. <laughs> okay. okay. So, I mean, I don't think, I couldn't have done nearly as good a job of, of describing to you what, uh, how great IES is and in what it's doing than Tom and Peggy just did. So, uh, I just wanted to mention two things uh, that I think we, we have a tendency to do that, that may be a barrier to, to people realizing all the stuff that's going on at IES. And the first is that if you've ever applied to IES, if you're like me, you've also been rejected at IES. And, um, so my last one I submitted, I thought it was the best proposal I ever made. It didn't even make it to the panel to get reviewed. It got, you know, it got rejected before it got further. And it's so easy to then say, what a terrible organization 
organization. How can this possibly, you know, everything they do must uh, be be not good because they didn't like what I did. And um, I just want to say that I do have that reaction, which I think everybody <laughs> does. But then if I think about all of the things that it's done, it's really transformed my work, not through the funding directly, um, through the IES training program for, for pre-docs and post-docs. It's transformed our university's ability to train people because not only does it give money for the training, but it kind of forces us together to create curriculum, to, uh, um, to run these, in, these workshops that go across universities, to really think about what it takes to, to develop scholars. And so I think that's incredible. And all the, all the data that's out there, I just couldn't have done my work with, without the data. And so um, I think it's really important to overcome the, the rejections that we all get and really try to look at all the other things that it's doing. So that's the first thing. And, and the second thing that I worry about is that people don't realize the information when it's there where it comes from, that we come to expect this information and we don't understand that the source of it uh, actually costs money and we need to advocate for it. I notice it in my class because they're always like, well, what happened in the beginning of the you know, 20th century in terms of students' achievement and when, thing, you know, and when uh, there were school consolidations? We don't know. You know there wasn't any information back then to, to do those kinds of things. And so if we're going to be able to kind of understand where we are, understand what we know, and to I mean, education is such a changing world. We, we, have, we have new things we want kids to know. We have new things we want them to measure. And, and uh, IES has been kind of amazingly good at adjusting to that, at, at creating the social emotional measures that, they, that we have now, of, cre of looking at the timing of how long people stay in it so we can understand how much kids stick with questions, whether they're progressing in the way that we want them to, to, to go. So I think it's, it's an organization that's really adjusted to our needs and it's adjusted to our opportunities. And um, both, I, I uh, encourage you to overcome both of the kind of natural inclinations to either say, well, it can't be good because they didn't like my thing, or just not notice where the information that, that we all use comes from. Because I think both of those two things um, uh, can keep us from describing what IES does and all the, the things that they really do. I know that I haven't uh, made as much of an effort as I should to kind of express this. I want to get Tom's uh, talk in particular and kind of show that to the people that I work with to, because it gives this overview that I don't think we have. So um, th that is my, those are my thoughts on it. I thought that really well done for someone who hadn't thought about it until just <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I thought a little bit about it but, uh, <laughs> before this, but that's only because I had a little prior warning. Um, I didn't want to be too embarrassed when I got here. But I'd, I'd like to, to uh, you know, scrap the prepared remarks and, and just emphasize something that I think our th our, both our, our moderator and our three speakers, uh, our two speakers rather, were uh, too modest to say. And that is that I spend about half of my professional career before IES came on the stage, and about half the career, that career since then. And it is astonishing the transformation in education research in that, in that last 15 year period. And, and I think uh, Kent is correct that he deserves some credit for helping to set the stage for, for the creation of, of IES. But, you know, back in the year 2000 or so, uh, I th I'm old enough to remember that schools of education were under, were under fire. Uh, quantitative programs in those schools were, were either uh, under duress or actually being eliminated, and sometimes whole schools or departments of education were being eliminated altogether because education research had a very awful reputation, to quote one of my colleagues from the University of Chicago. Uh, almost nobody had training in, in, in almost no school of education was providing training in, in advanced research methodologies like like uh, randomized trials or or the high-end quasi experiments um, today um, every reputable school of education is doing those things uh, before IES came along uh, very few people had ex in outside of the research firms had experience doing randomized experiments um, now hundreds of people do. 
Uh, and I emphasize that not because randomized experiments are the only important research methodology, but they are just an example of one strong research methodology that uh, there was really very little experience with in the education research community. And the analysis of complex quasi-experiments is even harder, and there was even less of that experience. And IES, IES created this the, the modern educational research environment that, that many of us take for granted now. Fortunately, the National Center for Education Statistics had been there for a while, and education, you know, a tremendous amount of education research depends on NCES data. Um, I don't, you know, I think half the doctoral dissertations in sociology would be undoable without it. Um, and it's important, so that has been a, you know, a cornerstone of our ability to, to, to do education research since before IES, but it's only gotten better since IES. And I think, um, there are many ways in which uh, the IES um, design was very clever in supporting the expansion and the improvement of education research. Uh, one of the things that happened simultaneous with the creation of IES was the creation through the No Child Left Behind Act. It didn't do anything else. It created a demand for high quality, rigorous education research because it was required for certain funding purposes. Uh, it created the What Works Clearinghouse, which um, has now evolved from the What Doesn't Work Clearinghouse into, the, into a clearinghouse that actually has some good examples of things that do work. Uh, and that was one of, one of several important dissemination vehicles for high quality education research. It created funding streams to make education research possible, high quality education research possible, uh, through the National Center for Education Research and the National Center for Special Education. They, create, they uh, created demand for research, funding for research, and then they worked on capacity to, carry, to, to do that research. The postdoctoral training programs, the summer uh, research training institutes for uh, established researchers, and the postdoctoral training programs all helped to build the capacity that now exists in, in the country for doing high quality uh, education research. And I, I think together, these have had a completely transformative effect on education research as, as I've experienced, experienced it from the first half of my career to the second half of my career. And I guess I would like to just urge all of us to take a moment and to recognize that this happened through the efforts of dedicated professionals who are making the sacrifice of being in public service to benefit all of us. And um, I think that our world would not be where it is today without IES and without the dedicated professionals who chose to go into public service in order to make the IES we have today possible. So I'm going to suggest we give a, a round of applause to those folks and uh, to all the others who aren't here who made, uh, who made the modern sort of world of education research that we uh, enjoy possible. So. <laughs> And I'll shut up now. Dare you say anything after that, Michael? <laughs> uh, I'll say just a couple things. Uh, one about NCES, and then uh, a couple observations more broadly about uh, IES and the entire effort. Uh, Peggy, you said that, that the ancestor of NCES was founded in 1867. I would never pass up an opportunity to use the word sesquicentennial oh. if I had a chance. So I think I, think I re strongly recommend that. Uh, I'll write that down. Uh, 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 about uh, yes, I, I strongly agree with uh, my colleagues here. I'm, I'm, as some of you know, uh, leaving my position as president of the Spencer Foundation in a couple months. And I'm leaving feeling very optimistic about the future of education research. Uh, and I think that is in good part owed to the contributions of uh, first Russ and uh, then John and his successors uh, with uh, Russ showing tremendous force and discipline in introducing this uh, notion of rigor and peer review in a systematic way into the, the work. Uh, and John in marrying that to relevance. Uh, and I think 
You know, we all know that, that uh, uh, processes of learning are involved in research communities as well as in people learning how to use the results of research. And I think we have come as a profession to assimilate uh, both the usefulness of random control trials and their limitations and the potentials to make them more valuable. We are also coming to assimilate the fact that, that the engagements of, with the practice community are not just dissemination, which is, is a word I abhor because it says, we're at the center and we're handing it out to you, but is much more an interactive process. Uh, I think the profession continues to learn about uh, ways to get more out of the random studies that we do. I'm very excited about paying more attention to variation across sites and multiple site experiments in the wonderful modeling that one of Larry's students did to help us, and you're going to tell me the name, uh, to help us understand. We did fund it uh, to help us understand better uh, to what degree one can see a particular trial as an appropriate drawing of a sample from a universe. And that was Beth Tipton. Beth Tipton. Yeah, scholar. this is this is fantastic work. Uh, more than any of that, I am really optimistic politically. Uh, uh, I don't know what the next three years are going to bring. Uh, this is not a, a reversible change, in my view. Uh, uh, either IES as it exists or under some new name will be back. You do not do scientific research and then revert to something less than what you have done. Uh, I do not believe that's going to happen. I also don't believe that anything is going to wipe out the amount of learning that has happened in the research community over this time. You know, in my early years at Spencer, uh, we would get proposals for random control trials that involved like eight people all together. And people didn't understand the technique, but they thought it was what they were supposed to do. And uh, we get, we see very sophisticated stuff uh, putting more and more pressure on people like me to find reviewers who can tell us how to assess this, this work. Uh, the profession is, has done a lot of learning and uh, nothing that happens in Washington can, can erase that. So uh, we're going to move, move ahead, I think, in exciting ways and I'm going to love to sit on the beach and watch it happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks to all three of you. Um, and I, I completely agree about the evolution that has occurred, you know, over, over time. Uh, has that provoked any comments or thoughts or questions um, from any of you? We have five minutes to entertain them. Oh my goodness. I'll wait a little more before I go to the, our, our public servants and ask them what more they want to say that, that they didn't have a chance to. All right. So we spoke a lot about the improvement in educational research more from a quantitative perspective and through randomized control trials. But I was, I guess one thought that I have is there has been a lot of increase as well in knowledge through qualitative research and mixed methods sure. research and specifically in education sciences as well. And I was wondering if anyone could speak to that as well and how you think the, the IES or the field in general might play a role in the development of those methods as well. Okay. Who wants to take that? I'll, I'll say something briefly uh, because, of course, Spencer has always defined itself around the idea that there are many forms of excellence in, in research. and. Uh, I think the example of, of Susanna's recent report on descriptive research, we, we see you can have large scale quantitative research, which is not uh, causal inference grounded uh, and can be very valuable. I mean, Raj mm -hmm. Chetty's recent mm -hmm. stuff, Raj, most people publish their working papers in, you know, little mimeograph publications. Raj publishes them in the New York Times, uh, uh, but it's great work. Uh, but I also think that more traditional qualitative uh, kinds of studies, ethnography and the like, the, 
everybody's raised their game. And I, I, I actually think both in direct and indirect ways, I, IES is a factor in doing that. Uh, we have, I think, broadly in the profession, a better understanding of evidence and of the criteria for judging whether evidence is reliable. And that does not rule out in any way qualitative work. In fact, it makes it possible to do it more credibly. So I, I think that's, that's on the rise too. I would just note uh, in our research grant programs, uh, we actively encourage mixed methods uh, designs. I think, it, again, is something that is not well understood about IES, that we're much more receptive and encouraging uh, than people sometimes presume. Uh, we actually held a uh, technical working group meeting on mixed methods uh, about two years ago now. A uh, very uh, good group of researchers from all over um, thinking about how to use these methods better to answer important education questions, um, particularly within the context of our impact studies, for instance, really digging down uh, to understand how programs are working and why, how people respond uh, to program interventions. Often you just can't do that work well without solid you know, mixed methods, qualitative methods, adding to the, the overall quantitative picture. I'll just say, uh, kind of piggybacking on uh, the point Mike made, uh, for qualitative methods too, uh, you know, just an insistence that it is hypothesis driven, that it is uh, thoughtful about sample selection. You may not have a large sample, but how are you choosing who is coming to the table? So those kinds of concerns, uh, you know, we've tried to, to signal are important and should be embedded in any design. And I, I would just add that even in the, uh, in the randomized trial training we do, um, that uh, qualitative parts of that work are a big part of what we try to get people to understand that it does, it, it, we, we're past the days of the total black box randomized experiment. That's, that's, that's no longer um, the, kind of, the kind of work that is cutting edge. Those were risky to do. Uh, if you spent all that time and energy and then couldn't say anything about why, yeah. you, you found what you found. Um, Peggy, um, I really appreciated Tom's uh, comments and what we heard here about um, uh, the reason to, to be strong advocates for uh, IES, what it has accomplished and what it's capable of doing. I actually think there's some evolution there too. I don't see the same arguments that I saw sort of at the beginning. And that's, I call that positive growth. Anything, any last words you'd have um, uh, about the center? Um, uh, anything at all that makes you anxious um, um, about the future or, or um, or what are you especially hopeful about? Well, you know, um, nothing profound, I don't think. But I do want to comment on this last uh, line of narrative because I don't think people think about a center like the National Center of Education Statistics doing mixed methods, but we do, and experimental designs. And I, I just want to point out that we're not um, just a qualitative a quantitative uh, a shop. So for example, uh, in collecting our assessment data, we use ECD, Evidence Centered Design by Miss Levy, which has a really strong qualitative uh, component to it where cognitive labs and think allows really help guide the development of uh, assessment uh, uh, items. And in addition, OMB has required that when we're developing uh, sur just survey questions, that all of them have to go through cognitive labs or focus groups. So we have to justify um, these, uh, these data collections, not just through uh, numbers, but through qualitative uh, indications that we are really uh, measuring what we purport to measure. So I, I, I want to emphasize that, but even on the experimental side, one of the things that we're doing is trying to uh, figure out how, improve, how to improve our response rates using adaptive designs in which we're looking at the propensity for um, respondents to respond based upon their propensity to say yes versus no with incentives and improving our, our uh, response 
uh, 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 item response for any particular sets of questions or the respondents themselves, as well as reduction of the bias. So everything that we're talking about applies to the statistics side of the house as well. You just don't think of it that way. Thank you, Peggy. We're at our time. Um, and, um, you know, I, I couldn't think of a better combination of people to have had this discussion, and I'd just like you to uh, join me in thanking them for, for doing so.